Matthew 16, 24 through 27. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, bare mantles and dusty shelves. Amen. Bare mantles and dusty, dusty shelves. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, today, we are so in love with you and so grateful to you for salvation, for the peace that passeth all understanding, for the joy of the Lord today, which is our strength. We're grateful, God, that we have a place that we can go to where we're able to fellowship and commune with you as a body, that we're able to worship corporately, we're able to extol the Word of God publicly, loudly, so that all might hear, even those who by chance or by divine design might be passing by. Oh, dear Father in heaven, we need today a word from the Lord. We need to hear from heaven. We live in an hour, God, when so many are displaying a form of godliness. But as the word of God warns us, they're denying the power thereof. You've admonished us, Lord, from such turn away. God, we want nothing to do with religious form or formality. We want the power of God. We want it in our worship. We want it in our praying. We want it in our preaching. Touch the speaker today with the anointing of the Holy Ghost that I might declare the Word of God with power, with authority, in love. Touch the heart and the hearing of every one God that will hear this message. Let their mind, their heart, their spirit today be cultivated and prepared by the Holy Ghost to receive it as good ground receives the seed. And let it take root, O oh God, and bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives. We ask it all today in none other than that precious saving wonderful name Jesus amen praise God and amen bare mantles and dusty shelves most of us who as children ever participated in any form of sport I didn't participate in a lot of sports. I was not a football player, although I might have been built for it better than some. I was not a basketball player. That certainly was not my game. But I loved baseball. I loved baseball. That was one game I could really throw myself into, pardon the pun. Well, I want to tell you, as a child, I got to play a couple of years in our little league in the town I grew up in. It was a very small town. We had about, I guess, maybe six or eight teams. And uh, I got to participate in Little League. My first year, I was terrified of the ball. 
talk about wanting to do something but just not hardly being able to. I was terrified of the ball. Every time somebody threw a ball at me, I'd wait till it fell to the ground, then I'd pick it up and I'd throw it to the person I was supposed to throw it to. Uh, I was just scared to death of the ball. I'd get up to the plate, the pitcher would pitch, and it didn't matter if he pitched it perfect right across the plate, right in the sweet zone, or whether he threw it way off somewhere. Every pitch in my mind was a ball. There were no strikes. They were all balls. I, I didn't see a one that was worth trying to swing at. In my defense, I had a, an abusive father who constantly found fault and constantly talked about us being weak and failures and unable to do anything and made fun of everything, uh, every effort we ever tried to make. So I think psychologically I may have been in a place where I was afraid to swing at the ball because I knew if I missed I was going to be made fun of and I was going to have somebody looking at me like I was a failure and a flop. So it was safer not to swing than it was to swing and miss. Well, my first year in Little League, I was on a team that was called the A's, the Athletics. My coach was Dougie Moffitt. And bless his heart, he tried everything he could to help me, but I just couldn't be helped. I, I just wasn't going to get it. He put me out there and right field where he figured very few were going to hit anything out to me because if they did they they had a home run i wasn't going to catch it that's for sure oh i'm telling you it was an embarrassing year it's a humiliating year but i went every game i i didn't i didn't stay at home i didn't fail to participate i didn't miss a practice i was there every time god knows i was giving it all the effort that i had Second year come along, and my mother asked my brother and I, do y'all want to play Little League this year? And my brother Michael said, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. And I looked at her, and I said, no. I said, I don't think I'm going to play this year. She said, why not? I said, no, I, I just, I was too embarrassed. I was too humiliated by what I went through the year before. I got up to the plate and everybody started laughing. I, this literally happened, folks. Everybody started laughing and they say, easy out, easy out. All of a sudden you'd hear all the players on the opposing team screaming out, easy out, easy out. I said, no, I think I've had about as much humiliation as I can handle in this lifetime. I'll, I'll sit out the second year. So I didn't play the second year. But that entire second year, I would go out in the backyard with my brother Michael, and I'd help him practice alone. And, of course, us neighborhood kids that squeeze out a game once in a while, you know. My father had over an acre, and we had a lot of land to play on in our neighborhood. And so us kids get together, we play. And do you know what? During that year, playing with my brother alone, I learned not to be afraid of the ball. All of a sudden, I figured, you know what, as long as I got that glove in front of the ball and I close it when the ball hits, I'm good. I'm good as gold. It doesn't matter how fast that ball is going. It doesn't matter how hard that ball is going. I'm good. And you know what, if I take a chance and I swing at that ball once in a while, there's, a good, there's as good a chance as any I'm going to hit it as I'm going to miss it. So all of a sudden, my... Thinking changed a little bit, and my skill set changed. And the second, uh, the third year come along, my mother said, do you all want to play Little League this year? And my brother Michael said, oh, yes. And I said, yeah, I think I want to. Well, guess what? I had to go to tryouts all over again a second time because... When you skipped a year, you had to go to tryouts and a team had to pick you. Well, wild, you're not going to believe this, but the team that picked me the first year did not pick me again this year. I got picked by another team. Now I'm going to be on the Eagles. Well, 
Harold Lennon was my coach on the Eagles. Our first game of the season, who should we be paired up against except for the A's, the very team that I played against, I mean that I played for the first year. My first time up at bat, I walked up to the plate. Now I had new skills, I had new, but they didn't know this, they hadn't seen it. I walked up to that plate, and the pitcher pitched his first pitch, and they're all screaming, easy out, easy out. All of a sudden, I swung that bat around, and that booger met that ball, and that ball flew and flew and flew, and it went right over the fence in center field. And I pranced around, and I ran around those plates. It was all just, you know, ceremony, because I had a home run. When you hit the ball over the fence, it's an automatic home run. I ran around that first base, second base, third base, home. And when I got home, who should be there to greet me? Not my coach, Harold Lennon from the Eagles. No, my former coach, Dougie Moffat from the A's. And all Dougie can say is, Chuck, why couldn't you do that for me? My third year playing, my, my second year playing, but the third year I could have played, they didn't cry easy out anymore. Now when I got up, they said, slugger at the bat. Slugger at the bat. That meant this is a guy that has a reputation for knocking the ball to kingdom come. Had a very different reputation. At the end of the year, I got a little trophy for the most improved player. And that little trophy, it wasn't that high maybe, but boy, I mean, it might as well have been five feet high. It meant the world to me. Now, in the house I grew up in, we didn't have a fireplace as many houses do. Uh, this is in New England, and things were a little bit different up there. We could have had one, I suppose, but we didn't. We've got one here at the house. I'm going to tell you right now, if we lived here and I was a kid, I'll tell you right where that trophy had gone. That trophy had gone right on the mantle, right over the fireplace. A lot of kids, a lot of y'all, when you were growing up and you'd accomplish something and you'd get a trophy or you'd get a certificate or you'd get some form of recognition or reward or appreciation, mom and dad would put that award right up on the mantelpiece because that's the heart of the home and we want to display our child's achievement and their success. I got news for you today. There's an old saying that says you can't take it with you and you can't. The Word of God said, Naked I came into this world, and naked will I depart. You came in with nothing, you're going to leave with nothing. But that doesn't mean when you get over to glory that you're not going to have something to show for your life over there. No, you see, you can't take anything with you, but you can send some things on ahead. Hallelujah! You can... Put some things up so that when you get to heaven, the home that God has for you will not be with a hearth that is empty and bare. And the shelves will not be dusty. But those hearths and that's those shelves can be full of recognition and reward and appreciation. And every certificate and every trophy and every crown, hallelujah, to the Lamb of God will be issued by the Holy One. Hallelujah. It'll be issued by the Creator of the universe. It'll be issued by the Savior of the world. It'll be issued by the Lamb of glory. There won't be one award on the shelf in glory that was issued by man. There'll be not one certificate up in glory that has the signature on it of a human being. Every reward, every trophy, every crown will have been signed, sealed, and delivered by God Almighty, Jehovah God, the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Jesus 
of the new. And he will personally deliver that reward. The word of God tells us in Matthew 16, our primary text today. What does it profit us if we get everything there is to get in this world and then lose our soul? What is worth exchanging our soul for? For the Son of Man, listen, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, why would you exchange your soul for everything in this world when this is going to happen? What's going to happen? The Son of Man's going to appear in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he's going to reward every man according to his works. So the Lord is saying, why in the world would you exchange your soul for everything this world has to offer when there is a day of reckoning and a day of reward coming, and every reward that is issued will come from God? Hallelujah. He's drawing the comparison. He's trying to help us understand. Look, you can either take what's behind uh, what you see in front of you, or you can take behind what's curtain number one, as they used to say on the old television game shows. In Matthew, the 6th chapter, 19 through 21, the Word of God declares, Lay up, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the Lord tells us you can't take it with you, but you can lay up still. You can still send ahead. You can still do something that will assure when you arrive in glory, your mansion on a hilltop, as the old song used to say, won't have a bare mantle and it won't have dusty shelves. Oh my goodness. Imagine walking into the home that God has prepared for you and seeing your mantle littered with trophies, crowded with rewards. Hallelujah. Imagine seeing built-ins. I like built-ins. Built-ins shelving on either side of that mantle just loaded with Certificates of appreciation and trophies and crowns which God has issued to you. Oh, but these things are not issued for man, man's efforts at doing what man does. These rewards, these gifts are issued for those things which are done on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on behalf of the kingdom of God, the Lord said in our primary text, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. So it's not about earthly desires and worldly desires and carnal wants. He said, and take up his cross and follow me. We, we often look at this and I think we fail to understand the import of what Jesus is saying. What does the cross represent? Well, most people look at the cross and they say, well, the cross represents sacrifice. So Jesus is saying, we must sacrifice. We must sacrifice. Oh, bless God, we've got to sacrifice. Um, no. More than sacrifice, the cross represented, listen to me, children, the will of God. So everybody must take up their cross. Everybody's got to walk in the will of God for themselves. You see, the will of God for my life isn't the will of God for your life. 
So there is nothing similar about my cross to your cross. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Everybody's walk is unique. Everybody's walk is different. Everybody's cross is different. Because the cross represents the will of God. Well, pastor, how do you know this? I know this because Jesus was speaking to his disciples of how he was about to go into Jerusalem and he would be tried and they would crucify him. He told them this. He said, but don't worry because three days later I'll rise again. This is the will of God. And here comes Peter. Oh Lord, far be it from you. Don't people just think they're spiritual when they start telling you what you want to hear. When they start telling you what they think you need to hear. Oh Lord, far be it from you. And Jesus turns to Peter and he rebukes Peter and says, Peter, shut up boy. Imagine the look on Peter's face. Peter got rebuked a few times, so I'm sure he, he had that look more than once. <laughs> said, you desire the things of man over the things of God. What was he saying? He was saying, hey, this is my Father's will for my life. This is God's will for me. This is where I have to go. This is the path I have to take. And therefore, I desire this path. I may not like it, I may not enjoy it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Sometimes you got to endure the journey. You don't like the journey. You don't enjoy the journey. I can tell you right now, I don't enjoy the journey. I've been in affirming ministry now for nigh on 27 years. Or about 27 years actually. I'd love to have a church full of people that love God, want to worship the Lord. I'd love to have a church full of people full of the Holy Ghost. I'd love to have a church full of people know how to pray down miracles from heaven. I'd love to have a church that is so full of the power and manifestation of the Holy Ghost that every non-LGBT affirming Pentecostal church in America was looking at us and saying, what in the world are they doing right? What are they doing that we're not? That's my vision. That's what I've dreamed of for all these years. I feel sometimes when I look around and see at what we've accomplished in this ministry over 27 years, and I think, Lord, I'm not one day closer to realizing that vision, that dream, that hope that I've had. We're not one minute closer than we were 27 years ago when I first prayed and asked God for a name that we could call this new ministry, and He laid on my heart, Grace Oasis Ministries. You don't have to be happy with the path. You don't have to necessarily enjoy the path. But if it's the will of God, then you know that at some place, at some point, at some time, the harvest is going to come in. The Word of God says that we will reap if we faint not. Hallelujah. So if you just keep doing what God's told you to do, if you just keep walking in the will of God for your life, the day is going to come when you're going to reap. Nobody sows without some kind of harvest. You may harvest less than you had hoped. You may harvest more than you ever dreamed of. But at some point, somewhere, some seed has to be good. And it will bring forth fruit. And you will have a harvest. And the Word of God promises us this. And the Word of God tells us through the lips of Jesus Christ, the living Word of God, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. But everything you send ahead has to be based upon what you've done for and on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. You have to have walked in His will and in His way, not in yours, 
I know so many Christians today, it makes me sick. How many Christians I know today. I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church. It amazes me how many Christians in the world today will talk about what they're wanting to do and how they're wanting to do it. The businesses they want to open. The businesses they want to go in. Look at how many so-called Christian artists, and I hate that word. I hate applying it to any Christian endeavor. Singers and and musicians, look at how many start out in the church and then they find their way into secular entertainment industry. But you know what? I watch Gaither videos and I see a lot of people, Tommy, who are singing and playing instruments and they could easily be a superstar in the world. They could easily be. Sometimes on these Gaither videos, especially some of these people, they could be the most incredible country western singer that ever existed. Uh, Anthony Berger, who used to play the piano, I believe it was for the Kingsman or Gold City, one of them, I think it might have been the Kingsman. Anthony Berger could play a piano like you never heard anybody in the universe play a piano. He could easily have been a millionaire in the world if he had ever wanted a secular career. But he knew that the will of God for him was to play that instrument to bring glory and honor to God, to lead people to a place place of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he spent his life doing the will of God he carried his cross oh but pastor if my cross doesn't lead me to wealth and fame and popularity if my cross doesn't bring me to a place of renown and celebrity then I want nothing to do with it well then God help your soul. Because if you're not willing to lose your life, you're not going to find it in Christ. That's what Jesus said. Everyone that is trying to find life will find it only if they'll die out to themselves. Am I telling the truth now? Oh, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> my death in ministry has been long and hard. It's been painful. I've had men and women in the LGBT affirming Pentecostal movement ridicule me, mock me, make fun of me, spread rumors about me, publish things on the internet negative about me, speak negatively about me to every single person that they've ever come in contact with. I have certain groups that have marked me and they've done nothing for over a decade. Actually, about two decades. They've done nothing but do everything in their power to, dis to besmirk my reputation, to try to call my integrity into question. They've done everything in their power. And they call themselves Pentecostals. They call themselves Christians. They call themselves LGBT affirming believers. I could easily have compromised. I could easily have given in and said, you know what, I can shut their mouths. I can fill this church. I can get all kinds of people in here. Folks, if you think this old preacher hadn't been in this thing long enough to know how to fill a building, you're out of your mind. I know how to fill a building. I know what... Games and gimmicks many churches and pastors use to fill a building. But I'm too stubborn. You can call me too stupid if you'd like. That's all well and good. I'm going to do it God's way or I'm not going to do it any way at all. I'm going to carry the cross that the Lord's given me to carry or else I'm not going to do this at all. Because when I get to heaven... I don't want a bare mantle, and I don't want dusty shelves. 
when I get to heaven, I want there to be something laid up. I want to have done something on behalf of the kingdom of God and the righteousness of that kingdom. I want to have done what was necessary. I want to have done what was the will of God for my life so that when I get up yonder, I'm a bit of a pack rat in this life. Quiet, Tommy. We need no amens, no nodding heads, Amen. no big grins. <laughs> some might call me a hoarder, I guess. I'm not as bad as some of them on TV, but I'm bad at certain things. I like to be prepared. I was in the Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts taught be prepared. So, I mean, literally, if I see something and I know 10 years from Tuesday I might need it, then I buy it. I'll get it because I know one day I'm going to need that. I love my tools. Put me in a, in a Lowe's or put me in a Home Depot or put me in, well, I won't shop at Home Depot. Their founder was a Trump lover and I'm not, so I don't, I don't spend a nickel at Home Depot anymore. Haven't for years once I learned that. Put me in a Lowe's, put me in a tool department at Sears. I'm, you might as well call me in heaven. If I see something that I think that I might one day be able to use, then I like to go ahead and get it and have it. You know, I'd love to get to glory and have done so much for the Lord Jesus Christ and have, have done so much for the kingdom of God, have done so much to uphold the standard of holiness and righteousness in the church which God requires and asks of us. I'd love to get to heaven, Tommy, and have to kind of cut a path through the room so I can walk. Because all the rewards and all the appreciation and all the gifts are taken up. I'd love to get to heaven and find out that I was a spiritual hoarder as well. Amen. That would thrill my soul. When I was a child, when I was young growing up in church, one thing that preachers used to preach about constantly was a burden for souls. Do you have a burden for souls, child of God? If you lack a burden for souls, you need to get in the altar and pray until God gives you one. Because the most important job any child of God has is helping others to find their way to the foot of the cross. Helping others to find their way to Calvary. Helping others to find their way to salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no greater responsibility that we as God's people have. And this is why we live a holy life. This is why we live a godly life. This is why we follow after righteousness. Because the light that is hidden under a bushel does no one any good. If you look like the world looks, talk like the world talks, dress like the world dresses, acts like the world acts, then what in the world about you is any different that I should follow the path you're on? Why should I take up a cross of my own? Why should I lift up the will of God in my life? You're not lifting up the will of God in your life. You're not following after the will of God. You're not putting first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I don't see God blessing you and prospering you and giving you favor. I see you having a lot because i got news for you folks. You don't have to be blessed of God to be wealthy or to be successful or to have many things. The enemy offered Jesus everything in the world. He offered the Lord every kingdom in the world, didn't he? Mm -hmm. During that period of temptation in the wilderness. So apparently the enemy has quite a bit to offer as well, didn't he? So don't think for a minute that just because somebody has something that it come from God. 
But if you're a child of God and you're living for the Lord and you're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then the Word of God said every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Hallelujah. So when you're a child of God and you're living for the Lord and you're putting His will first in your life, if you've got it, you better believe it came from God. Amen. Say, I tithe. I give to the work of God. I don't get any payback for that. Well, first of all, if you haven't got any payback from that, you're not doing it right. You need to do it in faith. You need to do it knowing that the Word of God promises given, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. I'm going to tell you, I give. I believe in giving. I love to give. And I'm not one of those preachers gets up and tells people, and Tommy can tell you, anybody that knows me can tell you. I'm not one of those preachers gets up and talks about, give, 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 here's my address. But when I see a need, if there's any way in the universe I can meet that need, if somebody's hungry, if somebody needs... I've taken the coat off my back and given it to a homeless man who needed it more than I did. And I don't say that to brag. I say that to say that I believe in giving. I believe that there is nothing futile when it comes to God. Anything you do in Jesus' name, I guarantee you, the Lord said, not only will you be paid back in the... the with the eternal life, but you'll be paid back in this life as well. I believe in giving. I'll tell you a little secret. I believe one day I'm going to get to heaven and I'm going to look at a shelf and I'm going to see some little knickknacks there. I'm going to see some little trophies. I'm going to see some little crowns. I'm going to see some certificates that are related to my giving. Why? Because I gave in Jesus' name. I gave to advance the kingdom of God. Everything I did, I did because I was trying to walk the path that God had placed before me. I wasn't trying to walk my own path. I wasn't trying to pursue my own journey, to follow my own will. But rather, I took up my cross. The will of God for my life, I took up my cross and followed Jesus. Mark chapter 10, verses 28 through 31. Then Peter began to say unto him, meaning Jesus, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands. With persecutions. So in other words, you're going to get those things back, but it, it ain't going to be easy. It never is. Even for people in the world that have a lot, it never is easy. And in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. Get up yonder to glory and some of the biggest names in the world of Christianity that you've ever heard are going to be living in cabins. And these old saints that lived their lives humbly and peacefully, that loved everybody, that had no judgment to level against anybody, that just tried to be a light in a dark world, that tried to exemplify the Lord Jesus Christ and His teachings, that carried their cross faithfully, that did whatever God laid on their heart to do, and walked in His will and walked in His way. My Lord, they're going to live in the biggest mansion you've ever laid, because the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It's not about the order in which you're in line. It has to do with the level of reward, the level of payback. 
Oh my goodness, the last shall be first. Oh, but Billy Graham led millions to Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God. Yes, he did, as it were, with the help of millions of believers who supported him and gave to him. And I got news for you, every one of them believers is going to have their reward. Every one of them. Every one of them is going to have their part in the millions that Billy Graham is supposed to have led to Christ. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? It's an old song sung by a man who happens to be gay. He came out some years ago, and of course the Christian world puked him out. They don't want anything to do with him anymore. Ray Bolt. But Ray Bolt sang a song. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. When my grandmother Bill died, I understand they played it at her funeral. If there's anything my grandparents, not just my grandmother, but my grandfather and my grandmother believed in, it was giving. If there's anything in the world, I'm going to tell you, there wasn't a missionary that came through our church. And my grandfather, who was backslidden out of church, my grandfather, my, my grandmother would invite them over to the house for dinner. And before they left, my grandfather was slipping 200 or $300 into their hand to help them in their mission. My grandfather gave and gave again. I thank God every day for the example that my grandfather Bill set for me in terms of giving. He gave, and if it had to do with the kingdom of God, if it had to do with the work of God, he'd give even that much more. There wasn't a cause for Christ that he didn't support. I'm going to tell you, back in the day when Christian television was new and young, my grandparents gave to everybody that had a television program, Oral Roberts, and they were huge supporters of PTL. My grandfather loved the PTL program, and I don't blame him. Back in the day, PTL was one of the most encouraging, uplifting non-judgmental, inspiring Christian programs that could ever be shown on television. And Grandpa Bell would watch it and tears stream down his face as it encouraged them. And Jim and Tammy would encourage. And many times my grandfather and grandmother made a trip down to uh, the Carolinas and visited Heritage USA and they stayed in some of those hotels and they participated in some of the television programs being taped. Everything you do for the kingdom of God and His righteousness, everything you do, you will one day be rewarded for. Nothing will go without recognition. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. He's gone to prepare a place for us. He says, I'm coming back where I am. That's where I want you to be. He said, when I come back, I'm going to reward every man according to their works. Am I telling the truth? Everything you've done on behalf of the kingdom of God, everything you've done on behalf of Christ, you will receive reward for Oh, dear Jesus, the last thing in the universe I want when I get to heaven is a bare mantle and dusty shelves. How many believers live their lives down here on earth and the kingdom of God is the last thing in the universe they even think about? It is their last concern. When it comes to their time, the kingdom of God is last on their list. It comes to going to church, eh, I'll do it when I feel like doing it. it. comes to giving, 
to assist in the work of God. Hey, I'll give if I feel like giving. I'll give how much I feel like giving. The Spirit of the Lord speaks to their heart and says, I want you to do this. I want you to give this amount or I want you to give that amount. And they're, hey, no, Lord, I, I don't feel like doing that today. They don't carry their cross. They don't follow Christ. No. How do you follow Christ? You follow His example. What was His example? His example was He did the will of God every step of the way. He never one time stepped outside of the divine plan, did He? He didn't one time step out of, Oh no, we've got people that call themselves believers today. The will of God for their life is over here and they're walking over here. And they think when they get to heaven that their mantle will be crowded and their shelves will be full of rewards and blessings from the Lord. Matthew 25, 26 through 30, we read concerning the men that the Lord had given talents to. And when he returned, uh, only two of the men had invested those talents in order to gain more. See, everything you do on behalf of the kingdom of God, everything you do in Jesus' name, is an investment. The Lord said, you'll get back more in this life and in the world to come eternal life. Isn't that what he said? Well, that tells me everything you do on behalf of the kingdom of God is an investment. You will get a return on your investment. His Lord answered and said unto him, verse 26, Thou wicked and slothful servant, the servant who took what the Lord had given him and buried it, and when he returned, he gave the Lord back what he had been given to begin with. He said, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. In other words... I benefit from others' labor and others' work. Well, how do you do that? How do you benefit from someone else doing something that you're not doing? It's very easy. It's very easy. Anybody who works on Wall Street, anybody who invests on Wall Street understands it's called investments. If I invest in a farm, I'm not the farmer. I'm not doing the farming, but I still get back from all the work that he does. Am I telling the truth? All the crops that he harvests, I wind up receiving something back on that. Now, I haven't sown, I haven't reaped, I haven't done the work, but I've gotten back from it. So the Lord's talking about the concept of investment. He said, you know, Thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not straw, that I invest. I don't sit on my resources, I invest. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, you see? And then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury, with interest, with dividends. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Listen. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is no difference between a believer who lives like an unbeliever and an unbeliever. I believe the gospel. I believe Jesus died and rose again. I believe, you know, God gave me that measure of faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unto every man is given the word of God, says a measure of faith. But when God gives us that measure of faith that's necessary to be saved, that's necessary to believe and embrace the gospel, what do we do with it? Do we bury it? Sit on it? Well, when Jesus comes, I'll say, Lord, I believed! Yeah, wh where did that faith bring you? Where did that faith lead you? 
What kind of uh, journey did that faith lead you on? How were you able to invest that faith so that you might gain more? Well, Lord, I didn't do all that. I figured when you came back, I'd make heaven just because I kept believing that I just believed the gospel. As long as I believe, I'm good to go, Lord. He says, no. A believer who lives like an unbeliever is an unbeliever. Because a true believer is going to live like a believer. You can't say you believe in God and you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and then live like a dog. And the word of God said, what shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. So what are we going to do? Keep living like an unbeliever? Live in sin? Walk in sin? So that grace can be bountiful? No. It's not grace that's meant to be bountiful in our lives. It's faith that's meant to be bountiful in our lives. For without faith, not grace, for without faith it is impossible to please Him. Oh. So what God expects of us is to invest the faith that He's given us at salvation and allow it to bring more faith into our life. Because someone who sits on that faith and buries it, expecting to offer it back to the Lord at His return, will find out that a believer who lives like an unbeliever will experience the same end as an unbeliever. Luke 17, 7 through 10. I'm almost done today. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. The Lord's drawing a comparison here between earthly masters and servants, he said, you've got a servant. You pay this man to work for you. He's out in the field plowing. When he comes in the house, you expect him to wash up, make dinner, get it ready, put it on the table so you can eat. You don't have him come in from the field and then you look at him and say, oh, you poor thing, you, why don't you go sit and eat dinner? No, you pay him to serve you. You pay him to work. And when it's all said and done, you don't thank the guy for doing his job. Hello now. How many of us have employers who thank us? You know, Tommy, thank you for coming into work every day and doing your job. Thank you, Tommy. I appreciate your coming into work and doing your job. How many of us have employers that say that? What does that tell you about rewards in heaven? What does that tell you about laying up treasures in heaven? I'll tell you what it tells me. It tells me that those rewards and those treasures are for those who go above and beyond the call of duty. No, your boss will take you aside and say, you know, I know the last few weeks have been tough. I know we've had an awful lot of work to do. And I am so grateful that you were willing to come in and spend those extra hours. And you were willing to do what needed to be done to get the job done. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because you went above and beyond. If all you did was your job, what you're paid to do, you're already getting paid. It's not like you're not going to get paid. It's not like you're not going to get into heaven, okay? But why should I thank you for simply doing what you get paid to do anyway? But no, the appreciation and the rewards and the blessings come when we go above and beyond the call of duty. How many believers today are living their lives 
with that hope and with that promise from God that when he comes, he's going to reward every man according to his work. Well, if I believe that, if I really believe that, I'm going to go above and beyond what God simply asked me to do. I'm not just going to come to church. I'm not just going to pray. I'm not just going to worship. I'm not just going to listen to the preaching of the Word of God. I'm not just going to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. I'm not just going to do the bare basics. The Word of God tells us that some people are going to make heaven, and this is the language of Scripture, by the skin of their teeth. They will look down their child. They're not living like an unbeliever. No, they're living like a believer. But they're just doing the bare minimum. They're just doing what has been asked of them. They're just doing what God said. If you do this, heaven is yours. And that's all they've done, and that's all they plan on doing, and that's where it ends. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I know a lot of Christians like that. A lot of people go to church because they feel like, well, it's an obligation. It's something I'm supposed to do. So I go. They pray. It's something I'm supposed to do. They give. It's something I'm supposed to do. Finally, today in Matthew chapter 10, and I am closing, verses 38 through 42, and he that taketh not his cross. Now, weren't we talking at the beginning of this message about taking up our cross and following him? In Matthew 16, we were talking about that. In Matthew 10, the Lord said, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet, listen, shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth uh, receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where dust and moth doth not corrupt. What you do on behalf of the kingdom of God, he said, he that gives to a righteous man in the name, if you do something for a good, godly, decent person, because they're a good, godly, decent person, you're going to get a reward that commensurates with that action. He said, but listen, he said, but if you give to a prophet, in the name of a prophet, if you support a prophet because you recognize them as a prophet and a man or woman of God doing the work of God, he said you're going to get a prophet's reward. So again, what happens? The reward commensurates with the level of support. We have a man that for over 20 years has been an enormous blessing to this ministry. And we probably would have had to have closed it down. I don't know how many times were it not for Claude. I'm going to name him. I'm not going to give you his last name because I don't want everybody in the universe trying to look him up to beg money from him. That's what happens, you know, seriously. That's one reason why online and stuff I don't share people's full names, you know, because otherwise people use that as a list to go uh, uh, fundraising with, you know. But Claude, I met him over 20 years ago, and he saw the work that we were doing in the LGBT community, and he said to me, he said, if I don't attend your church, but I support you in what you're doing, because I believe what you're doing is important and essential to our community, would that be okay? I had never had anybody ask me that in my life before. 
I said, well, yes, I don't see why it wouldn't be okay. And for over 20-something years, Claude has supported my ministry. I got news for you. He's supporting a prophet in the name of a prophet. And he will receive a prophet's reward. Because the reward will commensurate with the act and the intent of the heart. Amen. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, too many believers, oh, they, they read the Word, they see what the Lord asks us to do, they try to be kind, they try not to lie, they try not to cheat, they try not to steal, they try to be good, try to live a halfway decent life. They pay their tithes. But bless God, don't ask them to give a nickel over that because they're not going to. I have a great aunt that was that way, boy, I mean to tell you. They do the minimum. And the Lord says, at the end of the day, nobody thanks you for doing what you were supposed to do to begin with. You got paid for the work you did. If you make heaven, you got paid for the work you did. Even if you make it by the skin of your teeth, you still have found your way to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But when I get to glory, and I enter that home prepared for me by the King of kings and Lord of lords, I don't want a bare mantle. I don't want dusty shelves. I want to have been motivated in this life by the will of God. I want to have done what God's called me to do. I want to have gone above and beyond the call of duty. There's an old song we used to sing many years ago. How many will there be any stars in my crown? Talking about have I led anyone to Jesus? I want there to be stars in my crown. Amen. I want there to be trophies on the mantle, certificates on the shelves. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.